Testing, check, one, two. There it is, thank you. Let's all stand up and pray together, please. Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, today to illuminate our minds and open up our hearts and unclog our ears and remove any barriers that we would have carried with us today that would keep us from hearing from you. I ask you, Lord, to help us to be emboldened to sharing the gospel message, to be able to worship you freely in spirit and in truth, to bless these people, to strengthen these people, Lord, to let them know who you are, and to show them your glory today, this day, as they worship you. And help them, Lord, to worship you. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. You have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 3. We started out last week and we we're going through the month of January on the concept of in the beginning trying to figure out exactly how this whole world got started and how that applies to us today, several thousand years later. Last week we looked at some key thoughts about creation. The first one was that creation is the beginning of God's self-revelation. And we discover creation is God's first word in our highest destiny. When He said, let there be, the Bible said there was. And there is nothing that can hinder God when he says let there be we can try to stop him we can try to hold him back we can try to push against it but eventually the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord now today I want to share with you another key thought and that key thought is this sin has a profound effect on our relationships with God and others Sin has a profound effect on our relationships with God and others. 1 John 2, 15-16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now go with me to the book of Genesis. We're going to read chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. It should be on your screen in just a moment. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Or have I commanded thee thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou givest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, 
and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return into the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother, mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I want to talk to you this morning about the fall. The fall. F.B. Meyer once said that when we see a brother or sister in sin, there are three things we don't know. First, we don't know how hard he or she tried not to sin. Second, we don't know the power or forces that assailed him or her. And thirdly, we do not know what we would have done in the same circumstances. It's very easy for us to give Eve a hard time. It's very easy for us to give Adam a hard time. Are you really that dumb? Are you really that stupid? You had a whole garden full of things. A whole garden full, and you had to pick the one thing, the one thing that you couldn't do. Well, just to show you how easy that is, for the next 21 days on your fast, Satan is going to greatly tempt you to eat one of the things on your list that you shouldn't eat. And no matter how big you are, or how strong you are, or how much willpower you have, some of you are going to slip up, and you're going to eat something you shouldn't have eaten. That's human nature. Because even in our perfect state, even before the fall, it was very easy for us to be manipulated. It's very easy for a forked tongue with soothing words to lead us off the path of righteousness into the path of death and decay. And yes, Adam messed up. And yes, Eve messed up. And yes, we're suffering for it today. But we are no better than they are. We cannot look at them with hindsight and declare what they should have or shouldn't have done. But what we can do is, <coughs> hopefully, learn from the mistakes of our forefathers. So we don't continue on the same path that they were on. Popular culture sometimes portrays sex as the original sin. I don't know where they got that from. But that's not what the Bible says. Rather, the original sin was three things. To question to challenge, and then to disobey God's definition of right and wrong. Both Adam and Eve made that tragic mistake, and it had immediate consequences. But the good news is that God had a plan to solve the sin problem. A plan that would come to fruition in the birth of His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's look at those three things right now. The first one is questioning God. God told Eve she couldn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This would keep her from being aware of sin, which would destroy her innocence and would ruin her joy. Yet the serpent told her that she would be like God if she ate of the tree, appealing to the pride of life. She saw the tree was desirable to make one wise, so she ate. This is the pride of life. It's a motive wrought in arrogance, boastfulness, and self-centeredness. Rather than bowing down, trusting, and worshiping God, the pride of life motivates us, as it did Eve, to want to see God in ourselves. <clears throat> Satan said, you're not going to die. If you eat that, you'll be just like God. This was how it always worked out, even from before we started rolling around on this earth. In heaven, Satan decided one day, that he could be like God. And so he subverted a third of the angels to willfully follow him in attacking God on his throne. God cast him out and Jesus said, I saw him falling like a star from the sky. Very first thing when we mess up 
is we try to assume we can be like God. We decide that God really doesn't know what's best in our lives. We decide that our moral compass is straighter than His moral compass. And we decide that the path that we've set before us is the straight path. God's path's too long, it's too hard, it's too winding. It takes us through too many places we don't want to go. It takes us through too many valleys we'd rather not visit. So we decide in the pride of our life, in the pride of ourselves, that we can do it better than God. And so Eve decided that God didn't really say what He said. God didn't really mean what He meant. And because of that, she fell. Second thing she did when she questioned God was to challenge God. Eve also saw the tree was good for food, meaning it looked like it would taste good and be satisfying and enjoyable to eat. But the pleasures of sin are temporary. And Eve fell for the lust of the flesh, trusting in her senses rather than in the word of God that was spoken for her. I'll tell you this right now and you won't like it, but I don't care. There are too many people that follow goosebumps instead of following the word of God and it leads them down past God never sent them on. There are too many people who follow their own emotions or somebody saying, thus saith the Lord to them because it fans their ego and it soothes their pride and they go down past that God never called them to go on. If it does not, back up to the word of God. Cast it out. It is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh trusts man's judgment, man's feelings, and temporary conveniences in lieu of God's inalterable word. And then once you question God, you would learn into challenging God, and then it finally takes you into disobeying God. Eve saw the tree was a delight to the eyes, for it was a beautiful creation of God. Sin does not necessarily appear as ugly, dirty, or destructive. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. The fruit that God told Eve not to eat was extremely enticing and attractive in its appearance. The lust of the eyes propelled Eve down the road of deception until she disobeyed God and incurred the penalties of sin. Once we question, challenge, and disobey God, we have consequences to our actions. And there are consequences of our sins. Yes, we're under grace. Yes, we're forgiven. Yes, it's thrown in the sea of forgetfulness. But that does not mean we do not have consequences for our actions. If I murder somebody tomorrow and the day after I ask God to forgive me, God will completely and totally forgive me. If I ask Jesus in my heart, I will go to heaven when I die. But that does not mean I will not spend the next 30 years of my life in jail because I have committed murder. There are consequences to our actions. Both Adam and Eve learned the hard way that the knowledge of evil corrupted their natures, resulted in distrust, fear, alienation, pain, and many other hideous things for the rest of their lives. Adam was never judgmental to Eve before they sinned. Adam was never condemning of Eve before they sinned. But as soon as they sinned, Adam said, this woman that you've given me, she caused me to sin. Eve never shirked her responsibilities before she sinned. Eve never tried to push the blame on someone else before she sinned. But as soon as she sinned, she said it was the serpent's fault. He beguiled me. I can't be responsible for my actions. How many, time in, how many times in courtrooms across the nation have people used a defense that I can't be responsible for my actions? Or I've had a crime of passion. Or I lost my cool. Or I lost my head. And just a moment, just an instant, can destroy your life. There are consequences to our sin. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life all work in collaboration to lead us astray, to keep us from trusting God's word and to fall for the schemes of the devil. So how, what are the consequences? Well, there's two. There's one in our relationship with God. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 verse 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. In the garden, God came down in the cool of the day and walked and talked with Adam. One on one, personal communication, no barriers, nothing to distract Adam or keep him from hearing exactly what God was saying to him. 
But now that we have sin in this world, there is a barrier between us and God. God cannot look upon sin. And on our sinful nature, we cannot know God. So there's a gap. There's a chasm, if you will, that keeps us separated from our Heavenly Father. That sin burrowed into the ground that we can no longer reach Him. And He doesn't walk and talk with us anymore because of this sin in this world. This is the biggest consequence of sin. Every sin is an offense to God and God cannot be in the presence of sin. That's why if we choose to keep committing the same sins over and over without repentance, we will stop feeling His presence in our life. The Holy Spirit will stop speaking to us if we refuse to repent. If you haven't heard from God lately, get on your knees and repent. Turn back to Him. My God, turn back to Him. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 19-22, through Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If you take to heart and apply these four verses in your life, you will hear God speaking through the Holy Spirit to you. And it also affects our relationship with other people. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I know we like to think that what we do has no consequence of anyone around us. We are masters of our destiny. We are masters of our fate. And what I do only affects me. But that's not what the Bible says. Sin has consequences that ripple outward like a pebble dropped in the middle of a pond. The ripples expand. And they expand. And then somebody else drops a pebble over here and those ripples expand. And then the ripples connect and they shatter. That's what happens when we sin. It doesn't just affect us. It affects everyone around us. It is very selfish of us as humanity to think that we're the only ones that are affected by our actions. That what we do only affects us and not someone else. When you choose to run your life instead of letting God guide you, catastrophic events can happen. <coughs> King Herod was an evil man. He was full of selfish ambition. When Herod the king heard these things, Matthew 2, 3 said, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. He had discovered where Jesus was born, but God, being omniscient, led Jesus away safely through Joseph and Mary to Egypt. Herod's rage led to massive destruction after he realized Jesus had been led out of Bethlehem. Matthew says in verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and set forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Herod's sin cost the lives of hundreds if not thousands of innocent children. Don't ever believe the lie of the enemy that no one will be affected by our actions. We are all connected. The Bible says we are all one body. If I stub my toe, my whole body is affected. If I break my finger, my whole body is affected. If I sin, my whole body is affected. But I'm not going to leave you there. I'm not going to leave you with the consequences because there's a third thing I want to talk about today. The solution to sin. See, all the way back in the beginning, way before any of this happened, God had a plan of redemption set in place. The Bible says that Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundations of the world. <clears throat> so even before sin entered this world, God had a solution. I love the fact that God has solutions ready before problems even begin. <clears throat> I don't have to worry about what's going on in my life and wonder how in the world is God going to get me out of this mess? How in the world is God going to get me out of this pit that I've dug for myself? Or how is he going to get me out of this pit that Satan dug for me and I fell into? God already has a solution in place before we ever encounter the problem. God had a plan. God had a plan of salvation. That plan was this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God started out with the law. He gave us commandments to follow. To guide us on the right path. But the problem is the law had to have man's involvement. 
We had to be able to use willpower to say yes to God and no to sin. And obviously, we don't have it. Because they continually fell short of the law. So God brought the law to completion through His Son, Jesus Christ. And now we no longer live under the law. We live under a concept that God gave us, which is called grace. Which is His love that He showed upon us. This is how the Bible says it like this. Romans 8, 1-8. through There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So in ourselves, no matter how hard we try, we can't please God. In ourselves, no matter how close we try to follow the laws and the statutes that God's given us, we cannot please God. No matter how good we attain to be, no matter how good we aspire to be, no matter how good our works are, we cannot please God because sin is in our absolute very nature. And God abhors sin. He despises sin. He cannot look upon it. So no matter how much good we try to be, we'll never be good enough to receive Him. And He knew this. And because He knew this, he gave us His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 2, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Then it goes on in verse four, chapter 4, verse 10, to say, Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is a fancy word. It means the turning away of wrath by an offering. And in relation to this, propitiation means placating or satisfying the wrath of God by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Now you need to understand something. God didn't hate us when we were sinners and then all of a sudden love us when we got saved. God always loved us. His love for us never faltered. His love for us never altered. His love for us never changed. But by receiving the sacrifice of Christ in our lives on the cross, we can now receive the love which He gave for us. When the veil was torn, there's no more barrier between us and God. I can walk with God now. I can talk to God now. Through the grace of the blood of His Son, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we can come before the throne of grace and cry out to our Father. I don't have to work through a priest. I don't have to work through a temple. I don't have any barriers or any levels that I have to go through to talk to my Heavenly Father. I have direct access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords anytime I'm willing to humble myself and pray and cry out unto Him. God always loved us. He's never stopped. Even in the garden. Even in the midst of everything, He never stopped loving us. Even when He cursed Adam and Eve, He never stopped loving us. Even when He pushed him out of the garden and wouldn't let him back in, He never stopped loving us. That was actually a great benefit. Can you imagine Adam and Eve having to live for eternity in sin? Because that's what, have hap what would have happened if they had eaten of the tree of life. They would have lived forever on this world with the thorns and the briars and the bushels and all the heartaches and all the suffering and live forever in sin. But because God took that eternalness away from them, they only had to endure the earth for a season of time. And now they're in heaven. No more pain, no more suffering, no more death. Rejoicing forevermore. This world's a rough place. There are thorns and there are briars. But we only have to endure for a short while. And if we accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, this is not our permanent dwelling. 
This is merely a temporary stopping point on our way to glory. If I can have somebody come to the piano, please. It's never too late to say no to sin and say yes to Jesus Christ. When God sent His Son, He redeemed us from the curse of sin. He redeemed us from the obligation of the law. He now gave us an opportunity to worship Him in spirit and in truth. But I have to make that choice. He gave us free will, which is the most, most bizarre thing in the universe. Because all God had to do was not put that tree in the garden and we wouldn't have had any of this trouble. If God had just kept that tree out, Eve could have never been tempted. Adam could have never been tempted. They never would have fallen from grace. None of these things would have happened. But, they wouldn't have worshipped Him out of love. They wouldn't have worshipped Him out of relationship. They would have worshipped Him because there were no other options. I have to wake up every day and choose to live my life. I have to wake up every day and choose to go to work, to go to school, to go to church, to raise my hands, to cry out my voice, to witness to those I come in contact with. I have to make a choice every single day who I will serve. Joshua said, it's up to you. Choose for yourself which God you're going to listen to. Choose for yourself which God we're going to follow. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have a choice to make. And there are consequences for either choice. There are consequences if you choose to accept God. There are consequences if you choose to reject God. Weigh them in the scales. Count the cost. Where do you want to spend eternity? The choice is up to you. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. It's difficult when we have to deal with sin. <coughs> it makes it difficult in our relationship with God. It makes it difficult in our relationship with each other. Especially the sins we carry around with us like a weight on our neck. The things that we can never seem to get deliverance of. Yes, we do good for a while. Yes, we're on fire for God for a while. Yes, we really struggle and try our best to be as good as we can be. But something always drags us back. Something always grabs a hold of us and pulls us back in. It could be a physical sin. It could be a spiritual sin. It could be a mental sin. It could be an emotional sin. Whatever it is, something always drags us back in. I'm here to tell you today that there is deliverance at the altar. Not just a temporary fix, not just a band-aid, but absolute healing and restoration. If you have anything in your life, any thorn that Satan shoves into your flesh that keeps you from totally selling out to God, I want to invite you to come forward this morning. We will pray with you and God will deliver you. Not just one time, but for all time. There is breakthrough here this morning if you're willing to accept it. If you're willing to accept God's gift of grace. Absolute, unconditional, unmerited grace and favor. If you want to feel that today, come forward and we'll pray with you. Thank you, precious Jesus. We exalt you today, O oh Lord. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We worship you. We exalt you. You alone are God. You alone reign. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Your word says to abide in you. And if we abide in you, your word says we will bear much fruit. Help us, Lord, to abide in you today. Draw us ever closer to you. Light a fire within our soul, Lord. Shut it up in our bones so we can't help but give you honor, give you glory, give you worship, give you praise, and fulfill the calling that you have placed upon our lives, Lord. Renew our spirit. Heavenly Father, we pray. We give you all the praise. In your son's precious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.